Instead of trying to do this by hand, I wonder if we couldn't contrive, I mean, control this numerically with a computer. This might sound silly, but I'm excited. This might actually be a fun project. But first things first, we need to set the stage here, establish some ground rules, get everyone some snuff, up to snuff. Yes, we're going to try to CNC an Etch-a-Sketch. That may sound facetious, perhaps even flippant, but if we're going to tackle the basics, it's probably a good enough place to start as any. In fact, given how universal the Etch-a-Sketch experience might be, the backlash that this thing is likely to have, and sort of the infrastructure we'll need to build to get this to work, this may just be an exemplary example. Not to toot my own horn. Specifically, I'd like to talk about the actual hardware here, the build itself, start to finish. What it takes to get from point A to point B, and then of course, point C and C. Which bits do what and why, what you'll need, how to wire it, that sort of thing. In order to do that, we need a project. I suppose we could do something more abstract. You could, for example, wire all this stuff on your kitchen table just for kicks and spin around some tape flags. or use it to fork up a very specific amount of spaghetti. But with any luck, a concrete project gives us some better context. And one last thing before I shut up shutting up. Scout's honor, but this is important. There are quite a few ways to do this. You certainly don't have to use the parts and software I'm about to demonstrate. In fact, my way might not be the best way for you. On top of that, I'm not exactly the captain of the CNC industry. I learned this by fighting through it myself. If there's a better way to do this, or I misspeak, bear with me. Let me know in the comments, but bear with me. The point of this video is to hopefully demystify some of this stuff and shove you over the edge. Give you that little nudge you might need to roll up your sleeves and get into some of this yourselves. I could give you a whole list of caveats and gotchas right out of the gate, but instead we'll talk about details as they come up. Sound good? Bottom line, if you're a CN specialist, I'd love your input, but this video might not be for you. In fact, if you watch it, you might even need a pry bar to get your eyes unrolled out of the top of your head. In my early days of computer control, I didn't have much luck. I tried screaming at the computer, hitting it with a stick, extortion, threatening its family. None of those worked. When it dawned on me that I needed some muscle. Middlemen, liaisons, as we like to say, if we think we're being bugged. And that, my friends, brings us to this magical device. A motor. Don't worry about what type of motor this is just yet, why we picked this one, and why it has two more wires than a naturally occurring motor does. Just know that motors, these little wonders of nature, take electrical energy and turn it into mechanical motion. Hope I'm not offending anyone, but you put power in the back end and the spinny bit starts turning. Think of it like Google Translate, but for the physical world. Our Rosetta Stone. The Etch-a-Sketch talks mechanical. The computer talks electrical. And this, this is our liaison. So okay, maybe we're starting to get somewhere. We have an Etch-a-Sketch that wants its knobs spun. And we have a motor that wants to spin when power is applied. Now let's just establish some common language so that when we spin the knobs, especially when we ask the computer to spin the knobs, we're talking the same directions. Now before that accident in 85, back before the government took away my employees, I'd sit in my smoking chair over by the lathe fire and bark out commands. Saying right knob, left knob, up, down, over and over gets tiring. So let's make up our own shorthand, our own little secret language. This knob here controls the cursor's left to right position. I don't know if you can see it, it's even got a little left to right arrow molded into the casework. Bear with me now, I'm making this up as I go along. For argument's sake, let's call the left right direction X. And the up down direction, we'll call Y. Now instead of saying left knob, right knob, we only need to say X and Y. And for direction, we'll use positive and negative. Positive X means turn the left knob clockwise. Negative Y means turn the right knob counterclockwise. 
For the Etch-a-Sketch, that covers all our bases. We can make four moves, plus X, minus X, plus Y, and minus Y. That's it, that's all we got. I can now give you instructions that say X4, Y4, X minus four, Y minus four. And if I could have turned those with robotic precision, we should have ended up drawing a square that's four turns wide and four turns tall. To recap how little we've covered so far, we have our thing we want to control, in this case an Etch-a-Sketch, but for you again that might be a lathe, a mini mill, or a CNC pizza cutter. We have something capable of performing the mechanical motion we need, again in our case a motor, two motors in fact since we have two knobs to turn, and of course the computer that will be barking orders. The computer need not be anything fancy, any old computer will likely do, but if you also plan to run CAD and CAM software, you're playing Pac-Man on it or watching this old Tony videos, you might want something with a little more punch. For just the CNC stuff, any relatively modern computer will likely do. I've seen CNC setups run on $100 tablet PCs. We'll talk more about the computer in a minute, but for now we have a problem. We have a ton of wires and there's really no apparent way to attach these motor wires to the computer. And even if we could stuff these wires under these keys somehow with a small screwdriver, the computer on its own isn't really designed to supply the power these motors need to turn. It can send out signals, but not hard enough to push the motors. To supply the motors with signals that make them happy, we need motor drivers. Since these motors are steppers, we need stepper drives. If you were using a servo motor, you'd need a servo drive. If you were using bagpipes to drive your CNC router, you'd need an air compressor. That last one might have been a bit of a stretch, but hopefully you get the idea. And since I said bagpipes, it's time to talk about these stepper motors. I'm not going to get into how and why they do what they do. That could be an entire video on its own. But for our purposes, suffice it to say that these don't work like regular electric motors. They're special. They don't just spin. If they did, they'd likely rip the knobs right off our Etch-a-Sketch. Instead, they only turn one step at a time. Give them a blip in the back end with a computer, and they'll move either clockwise or counterclockwise one step. These particular steppers move 1.8 degree for every blip or step you send them. I know that because it's written right there on the motor. Consequently, to make this motor do one complete turn, or 360 degrees, it would need 360 degrees divided by 1.8 degrees per step. It would need 200 steps or blips in the back end. It would need 200 pulses from the computer to move one full turn. If we wanted this motor to turn only half a revolution, only 180 degrees, we'd tell the computer to send 100 pulses. 100 pulses times 1.8 degrees per pulse is 180 degrees. So now what happens if 1.8 degrees is too coarse for us, if we needed something finer than that? Say we want our CNC pizza cutter to make super precise cuts, or didn't order enough pizza for everyone and need a lot of super thin slices. Well, you could gear it down. Say we attach this motor to our Etch-a-Sketch knobs with a 2 to 1 belt reduction. We had a large gear or pulley on the knob and a smaller one on the motor. And we use a belt or a chain or gears or whatever. Now when the motor turns one step, 1.8 degrees, the knob would only turn half of that because of the mechanical reduction. The Etch-a-Sketch knob would only turn 0.9 degrees. Cool, so we can cut our pizza accurately into twice as many slices as before. But because of that gear reduction, our pizza cutter would now move only half as fast. Our reduction gives us twice the accuracy, in fact it would even give us twice the torque, but the trade-off was speed. Imagine we needed a 10 to 1 boost in accuracy instead of 2 to 1. That would be one slow CNC pizza cutter and we now risk angering a hungry mob. But drives usually have a trick up their sleeve, a trick called micro-stepping. They can do some mathematical stuff inside that sends combinations of partial pulses down these four wires that can move or stop and hold a stepper motor in unnatural states. They can divide the degrees it turns per pulse into less what the native stepper is designed for. This particular drive offers it looks like eight micro-stepping options. Depending on how you set up switch two, switch three, and switch four, which are over here, it's a series of dip switches. Depending if you set them to zero or one, that combination dictates the micro-stepping. So if you set switch two, switch three, and switch four all to zero, it would be in half-step mode. If you switched two, three, and four to zero, one, and one, it would be in one-tenth micro-stepping mode, which would mean the computer would have to send 10 times more pulses to make one complete revolution of the motor. Instead of 200 steps, 
steps, it would have to send 2,000 steps. We'll get into more of what all this junk means when we actually wire this thing, but don't let this intimidate you. It's pretty straightforward. Just from their chart, I don't really see a way to turn micro-stepping off, which is what I would have liked for this demo, but it is called a micro-step driver, so maybe there isn't a full step option. Anyway, in light of what we said before, using micro-stepping to increase your accuracy isn't always what it's cracked up to be, especially for motors and drives of this <coughs> caliber. Better drives, of course, offer better micro-stepping, more reliable micro-stepping, but hopefully you can start to see there's a trade-off or a tuning situation you can get into between your mechanical side, how you attach your motors to whatever, gear reductions and torque and speed, and micro-stepping options. So there's a tuning loop in here that would technically also need to be accounted for. That's outside the scope of this video, but if this very basic vanilla CNC intro video works out, and we do more of these, I'd be happy to share what I think I know about that kind of stuff. Anyway, since we're here, let's wire the motors into the drives. Now this stepper motor has four wires. Most of them usually do, but it could have more, depending which type you buy. But here we have a pair for each phase, phase A and phase B. I'm not exactly sure which ones are which, but I'm going to assume red and blue are probably one phase, and green and yellow are another. You can use a meter, but an easy way to test is to short the coils out short the wires out. So with none of the wires connected, the motor should turn. If you short one of the coils out, the motor would lock up, so I guessed wrong. That's still turning. Blue and yellow. That's it. It's locked up. It won't turn. Let's try red and green. Yeah, I can certainly overpower it, but those two wires certainly make up one of the phases. If I short out both sets, that should be a lot harder to turn. Yep, now it won't budge. So there are two phases, and they're wired into the stepper drive phase connections, A and B. Pull this connector out and wire blue yellow into one phase and red green into the other phase. And don't worry just yet if the wires are in the right places, just make all your drives consistent. So if you did blue, yellow, red, green, in this case on one drive, do the same order on the other drives. Keep them consistent. We have some control over this in the software on the computer. You may have to come back and swap some wires if the directions are wonky. But for now, don't worry about it. Just make them all consistent. I'm gonna set all of the dip switches the same on both drives, by the way. So these are set to either one or zero, and there's switch labels there. I'm going to set switch two, three, and four all to zero, so we're half-stepping. These switches, five, six, and seven, depending how you set those, Set the drive current. Now it looks like these drives can do up to four amps. The motors that I have, if you go back and you look at the label where it said 1.8 degree, it states that they're three amp steppers. So you would set switch five to one, switch six to zero, and switch seven to one. But again, since I'm just turning the knobs on an Etch-a-Sketch, I'm just gonna set this to its minimum, half an amp. The next step in our little build here would be to wire the control signals, the sp and dir lines, step and direction signals, these would come into the drive from the computer. Before we do that though, let's chat quick about the hardware that we've been staring at. What you're looking at here is a kit I got from eBay for about $200. It came with three motors. These are NEMA 23s, I think. That's the frame size of the motor. They're good to about 400 ounce inches in the ballpark of three newton meters of torque. These could be okay for a small router, 3D printer, that kind of stuff. I mean, it really depends on how you design it and what sort of performance you're shooting for. Anyway, it came with the three motors, three stepper drivers, the things we've just been staring at, a power supply, a control board, and I think a cheesy little remote control I may have just thrown away. Now, for 200 bucks, all this stuff doesn't sound all that bad, does it? Though, and I hate to be cynical, I'm not expecting exceedingly high performance or a very long life with these things. For reference, my CNC router runs Gecko brand stepper drivers. This is a G210. I think this is an older one. I did quickly check their website and it looks like the cheapest standalone drive you can get will set you back about $110. So three gecko drives, one for each axis, would be $330 right there. Now, as we saw, this one with the kit is good to four amps. These gecko drives are good to seven. They can push a lot more current to larger stepper motors. My machine uses these. I think these are NEMA 34s. I'm using Sanyo Denki motors, but they're this size. Now, the terminal block isn't on this, it's still attached to the stepper. I was using this for my original fourth axis, but hopefully you can see the wiring is pretty much the same. There's the four wires from the stepper motor, then there's direction and step signal. This does the current limiting or the current set via a resistor. 
there's a little chart here. Depending which resistor you'd wire in the screw terminals would set the current rating for the drive. This also has a disable feature. So does this drive. We just haven't looked at it yet. Controller boards are what we'll talk about next. Again, this is the one that came with the kit, but I won't be using this one. I'll be using a PMDX424. This board by itself cost me $250. And doing some seat of my pants math, a decent control board plus three gecko drives would set you back, I don't know, about 600 bucks. That's not even counting the stepper motors. The kit with everything in it cost me 200. Hopefully that illustrates that this is very much the case of you get what you pay for. If you'd like to just learn, get your feet wet, or make a very small machine, this kit would probably be fine. But I wouldn't bank on it lasting very long or giving you completely trouble-free operation. One thing to watch out for, and why I'm not using the control board in the kit, is that this won't work with Mach 4. Mach 4 is the software I plan to use on the computer that runs this whole operation. This probably won't work with any of the free Linux translators either. It uses its own proprietary software that came bundled on a weird looking CD with the kit itself. Again, probably fine to learn with, but I wouldn't put much stock in a board like this. Though to be fair, it does look pretty well put together. I'll give it that. Off the cuff, it does have two more relays than the PMDX board does but I'm sure it wouldn't take very long staring at the spec sheet to see what the real difference is between these two boards are. Okay, so control boards. Not exactly sure where to start with these. As we said, there are a pair of step lines. This is where the computer sends the step pulses the drive uses to turn the motor, and a pair of direction lines, which as the name so cleverly implies, tells the drive which direction each one of those pulses that are coming in are meant to go, clockwise or counterclockwise. So if you send just a pulse or a step, that alone isn't enough for the drive. It needs to know which direction you want that pulse to turn the motor. Now back in my day of homebrew CNC, we're talking 10 years ago at least, mind you. Those signals would come straight from the computer through the parallel port. Anybody remember one of these, the old printer style parallel ports? The software would map some of these pins to be step and direction signals, and you'd have to somehow wire this to that. Not exceptionally easy to do. So you could buy what is called a breakout board, something that looked sort of like this. This isn't a parallel port breakout board, this connector doesn't fit here, but it should convey the idea. It had a socket you could plug the cable into and screw terminals that broke out each one of those pins. That way you could wire your parallel port to your drive. That's what these control boards also do. They're also breakout boards. However, instead of using the parallel port, these happen to be USB. USB connection here and USB connection here. On my router, I use an Ethernet smooth stepper. It's more or less the same thing, except it sends the control signals over Ethernet instead of USB or parallel port. An Ethernet smooth stepper, as of this video, would set you back about 180 bucks. It's actually less expensive than the PMDX board, but notice that the smooth stepper doesn't have screw terminals or relays or anything like that. It requires additional hardware. Again, there are a dozen ways to do this. In fact, if you're a masochist, you could do this with Arduinos and gerbils and all that kind of stuff. Back when the parallel port was all the rave, the operating system of the PC itself was the real-time controller. It sent the signals to the pins and the drives pushed that to the steppers and the steppers did their thing. The problem with that is the real-time part. Now real CNC machines, professional machining centers, have dedicated hardware. I mean, I think they do anyway, but they did. The PC with the software was acting as an emulator. So if your operating system even so much as blinked, well, it could interrupt control. You couldn't play Pac-Man or watch this old Tony. If you get an instant message from your mom pop up or a system update, that could stall your G-code. I mean, think of it like GPS. If GPS instructions for some reason got laggy and weren't real time and told you to turn a mile before or a mile after your exit, it could cause some problems. Now, although these are breakout boards, they're primarily pulse engines. They take all that real-time heavy lifting off of the operating system and do it themselves. These generate the pulses, timing, and switching on their own, getting only their instructions from the PC and storing that in some sort of buffer or something. Run their own clock that runs your steppers or your server motors. So with these, while your CNC is doing its thing, you can play games, watch this old Tony, or wish your mom a happy Thanksgiving. If you decide to buy one, just make sure it supports whatever G-code translator you intend to run. I plan to use Mach 4 Hobby for this demo. This PMDX board is designed to work with Mach 4. It won't run Mach 3. The smooth stepper will run 3 and 4. There are other other options, you could try some of the free open source Linux based translators. They are a lot cheaper of course, but you need a PC running Linux and frankly that's just a lifestyle change I'm not ready for. We'll certainly talk about the software more in depth later, but I just thought I should mention that now. 
No reason to be alarmed. Deep breaths now. Other than a few more wires, this is still the same setup we've been looking at so far. Let me walk you through it. I have attached most of the components to a piece of MDF. The components that I could attach, the motors are just sitting there. This is how the pros do it. If you're a hobbyist, you could build all this stuff into a nice enclosure with fans and switches and lights. I've got the two drives wired in with their respective motors. This will control the X knob and this will control the Y knob. I put some tape on there with some labels just to keep track of them once they start moving. Now, if you had a Z axis, like on a mill, to raise and lower the head, you'd have another set of these, X, Y, and Z. And of course, they're still wired as before. If you can follow these wire bundles, it's still the four motor wires going to phase A and phase B on their respective drives. While we're here, I also wired power to each drive. That's this purple and green line here. In this case, it's 36 volts DC, a pair to each drive, but that depends on the drive that you use. This kit already came with the appropriate power supply. And speaking of which, I've wired all the power through a terminal block. This was an attempt to keep things neat, but by the looks of it, it's not working out for me. There's line power coming in from the wall. It's split into two sets in the back there. One goes off screen to the power supply and the other set go to the control board. Coming back from that power supply, we have the 36 volts of DC, and that's one set green and purple going to the X-axis drive and another set green and purple going to the Y-axis drive. And this is that line voltage coming into the control board. So this set of wires sneaks under the board, it's up on some standoffs, and provides power. This thing is currently disconnected, powered down, but be careful around that. You can get DC versions of these, or DC versions of control boards in general, in which case you may need a separate DC power supply. Anyway, it's got power. USB is connected to my laptop. I've made the step and direction connections for X and Y. This bundle is the X motor, goes to the X drive, and this bundle is Y. This would be Z, this would be an A axis or a fourth axis. This particular board also controls another motor, but I think these might be slaved together. Like if you had a really big router with say, two motors driving the long axis or two lead screws, this would drive them in sync. In addition, I'm taking five volts off of one of the board outputs. These just serve to enable the drives. We'll look at that in a second. So for this particular board, just to recap, all those terminals are X drive, Y, Z, fourth axis, and then I think synchronized fourth axis. Then there's a series of outputs. You could use that to turn on spindles or ring the doorbell at your front door to prank the dog, start coolant pumps, flash warning lights, that sort of stuff. The second to the last block, and I haven't done my homework here, but I'm just reading the silk screen on the board, those five terminals read encoder. I guess this thing can also accommodate feedback. And the very last block is an emergency stop. The emergency stop terminals have sort of this spade connector wired into it from the factory. I received it this way. It's shorting those first two screw terminals. If those two terminals aren't closed, aren't connected, the board won't run, the software won't run, the drives won't run. It should have one or more of those gigantic red panic buttons wired to it. So if something goes wrong, you could slam it and everything comes to a dead stop. Those should all be wired normally closed. It's a fail safe. So if one of your wires comes loose or something breaks in your e-stop system, the board would fault out and everything would stop. If it were wired normally open and you did have a broken wire, when you slam that e-stop button, that signal would never get to the board. These other two terminal blocks on the back are the inputs to the board. So this is where you'd put things like limit switches, I don't know, temperature, humidity sensors, depends what you're building. Usually limit switches go there. This board also provides two additional headers. There's one there at the front closest to the camera and one just sort of looking past what I think is some kind of regulation circuitry, converting the line voltage to DC to run the board. You can buy additional cards for those slots that do things like spindle control, you know, control your spindle speed right from the software. You could also plug in additional breakout boards there to get more inputs and outputs. So if you'd like a CNC machine with one of those Star Trek style control consoles with the lazy boy and the blinking lights, you could wire separate panels like that into those headers. But anyway, we were last talking about the step and direction signals. If you read the silk screen, J7 and J8, that's motor zero and motor one. In our case, that's X and Y. Each one of those terminals has three connections, common, step, and direction. So I'm using brown for common, and on x-axis, for example, I'm using white for step and pink for direction. Back at the drive, in this case for the X motor, you can see how I've got the step and direction wired in there. I've got the comm line split, the brown wires go into step positive and direction positive, and then the direction signal and the step signal to the negatives. That took a little bit of reading, a little bit of figuring out. I'd never used these drives before, but if you buy one, you take a look at this wiring, this seems to be working so far. 
The other two wires, this blue and this black, is the 5 volts I mentioned earlier that I took off the output side of the control board. That is to enable the drive. This drive won't do anything at all unless it's seeing 5 volts in those enable lines. And that's really it. That's the bare bones basic setup really. This honestly isn't all that hard to do. Follow the instructions for your particular hardware. That's easier to do if you buy sort of the good stuff. The manuals in the support community for both the PMDX and the Warp 9 Smooth Stepper control boards. Absolutely amazing. The manuals for these drives and the board it came with. I didn't really look at it too long but you can maybe use your imagination. If you do use the kit, it seems pretty straightforward. There are some extra terminals, the labels match, so it's just wire to wire, so there is that. My computer is running. The installation for this board was dead simple. The setup files are already available on their website. I just ran the installer and it pretty much did everything for me. Let's power this up and move the motors. Mach 4 Hobby is configured, enabled, and in control of the hardware. There are keyboard keys mapped to the axes. By default, up and down arrow is Y and left and right arrow would be X, but I lost these in a tragic childhood accident and have remapped them to, I don't know what that is, page up and page down. Now that we've established electronic or computer dominance over the physical world, you can really control whatever any way you like. Add some kind of a SIM card receiver and I don't know, feed your cats with a phone call. Next step is to somehow get these motors attached to the etch. All right, all right, fine. I can't keep this straight up any longer. Everything is mounted and wired. Just not right lying to you folks. I'd love nothing more but to get into it with you, but this video has gotten way too long. And the next steps involve the software configuration and calibration. What we've done here is really only half the story, probably a third of the story. And the software, is what we'll get into in the next video. So I think that's it for now. If anyone has any questions about what we did or didn't do, let me know down in the comments and I'll do my best to answer those in part two. Unless you're gonna ask about using that third motor to invert this thing, shake it to erase the Etch-A-Sketch. In the back of my head, I had planned to do that, use it to just rotate this entire assembly up and down a few times, but it turns out you really gotta shake the heck out of this thing to erase it. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching.